question. So before we start, I just want to give you all a heads up. We are going to be streaming, maybe are streaming now on HowlRound TV. So um, thank you for everybody who hopefully is joining us from the, the interwebs. Um, so uh, welcome. Uh, this panel is, hopefully you're in the right spot, that you wandered over here in the, the wet weather. Um, we are going to be speaking about um, careers in the arts and also about how equity, diversity, and inclusion um, plays into that in um, hiring, recruitment, uh, professional development in our theaters. Um, so this evolved um, from the, the League of Resident Theaters, MORT, um, which is a collective bargaining unit of uh, professional theaters all across the US. Um, and Lort was, had a, has a diversity task force working to diversify our theaters. And so uh, twice a year when Lort has their meetings in different cities across the US, um, we started doing these ambassador panels to engage with local students in those different cities. Um, and partly to, for the theater leaders to get to know young people who are looking to pursue careers in the arts, and also for those young folks to uh, know more about what opportunities there are for them, for smart, young, ambitious, engaged uh, people um, to bring into our fold. So um, I would like to uh, start by um, just getting a sense of who is in the room here. So, because uh, this panel is open up also to non-conference attendees and local students. So, um, do we have any high school students who are here locally? No? Any college students? Great, awesome. And any grad students? Fantastic, yes. And other conference attendees? <laughs> awesome, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, so that helps us too, knowing, knowing who we're talking to. That's great. Um, so uh, let's let's go ahead and start with uh, introducing our panel. So I'm just going to let you all say a little bit something about yourselves, um, and if you can give us the sort of one or two minute version of, if that's possible, of uh, your career path to how you got to where you are right now. And I noticed that everyone left this chair empty, so that <laughs> you all would have to go for it. I sort of did. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Leslie Johnson, and I'm the Director of Social Strategy, Innovation, and Impact at Center Theater Group in Los Angeles. Um, I've been in that job for a year. It's a new fancy title, which I can tell you about as we talk. Um, but for the past nine years, I've been the Director of Education and Community Partnerships at Center Theater Group. Um, I, I like to claim I was walking over with one of my colleagues this morning, and I was telling her, you know, I'm not a theater person. I'm always doing this motion. I'm not a theater person, although I've worked in theater for nine years, so maybe I should claim it. Um, my path to um, this moment in my career, um, uh, like I think a lot of us, uh, was winding. Um, when I was um, growing up, there were not um, MFA programs, there weren't arts education master's degrees, arts administration master's degrees. Um, so, um, and I don't think a lot of people even knew that there were, that you could have a career, I know I didn't know that you could have a career in arts administration. I was passionate about art um, and, um, and culture um, and learning. I can't come from a family of educators. Um, and I just thought I wanted to be a teacher, so I got my teaching credential um, and spent some time in it as an educator, uh, but kept being drawn back to culture and cultural institutions as a different mechanism for learning and I think maybe a more democratic and accessible mechanism for um, <coughs> everyone being able to learn and express themselves. Um, so um, sought a, a, a job in the arts and I'll, I'll tell you in all honesty, um, this was before the internet. So um, there was an organization in Los Angeles called the Los Angeles Arts and Business Council that produced a yellow pages type book that listed all the arts organizations in LA County and after I had a Getty internship um, for multicultural, to increase multicultural um, uh, constituents in arts administration, the last thing they gave us was that book. And I went home and on my typewriter, <laughs> eyes opened up, starting with A, and I went through in every organization that had an arts education icon, I sent a paper resume to. <laughs> and that's how I got my first job in arts education, working for a very small nonprofit that sent artists from the community into schools, and this was really part of the um, 
the decimation of arts education in local schools, so we were sort of a gap organization that helped um, the schools have um, music theater, um, dance, and visual arts. And so that's kind of, you know, I, I, and then I, you, know, you wind your way through, and a lot of that was through people, people I met along the way. Good morning, my name is Kelvin Dinkins, Jr. I'm the general manager at Two River Theater in Red Bank, New Jersey. I've been in my post for about three and a half years now. I left undergrad sort of not knowing what I wanted to do. I was a performer, a writer, and a director, but I said I didn't think you could make a career out of to go on endless auditions, and I knew that just wasn't me. Um, but I loved producing. I took a couple of courses in producing and thought that it might be interesting, but I always thought that producing was Broadway, and that was sort of the only mechanism to get to that line of work, and I didn't know anyone who was doing that, um, much less anyone who looked like me who was doing that. Uh, so it was one of those things where I was sort of floundering after college. I interned, and you know, I was there, and I was kind of fit, trying to figure out where I'm supposed to be. And I got a call from someone who was working out at Intamon Theater, who said, listen, do you want a job? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> um, what, what, you know, working in regional theater um, would mean for me. And so she mentioned associate general manager. And I said, well, that sounds good enough. I've learned a lot. It's general. So I <laughs> And it was one of those things where I just, I up and, you know, came from the East Coast to the West Coast. I worked at Intamon in Seattle for about 10 months. Uh, it was an exciting uh, time there for that organization. And from there, I went to grad school because I just figured that there was so much I didn't know and there were so many people I didn't know that I thought getting a master's education would be my best benefit. And it turns out that was right, um, which has been great. Really after I finished uh, at Columbia, I found Two River, um, or Two River found me, a fellow, former coworker was working there. And she said, Kelvin, we have a general manager post open. And I was like, well, that kind of sounds like a big job. It sounds like a lot of responsibility. I don't know if I'm there yet. And she said to me, and I'll never forget it, she was like, Kelvin, you take the interview. You always take the interview. <laughs> so I said, fine. And you know, here I am three years, three and a half years later, and I've learned so much through TCG, uh, being one of their inaugural Spark Fellows, um, which is for the leadership development of uh, leaders of color. Um, and so I'm really a part of this family now and a part of this network of, of producers and artists and creators and technicians um, that has really built up and supported me uh, throughout the and So that's why I'm here. Uh, I'm part of Lord's Executive uh, Board of Directors now and the chair of their Lord Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Initiative. My name is David Stewart, known as D. Stu in the industry. And <laughs> And I am the director of production for the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I've been there for a year and a half. And I got my BFA in stage management at Webster University a long time ago. Um, and was a professional stage manager for 10 years uh, across the country. And um, eventually ended up at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison as a production manager. And soon after that, I got involved with USITT, United States Institute for Theater Technology. And I uh, started getting involved in, started getting involved in this equity, diversity, and inclusion work, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but eventually, I became uh, part of the, uh, the board for USITT, which I'm currently uh, serving. Um, but when I started doing this work, in particular, around equity, diversity, and inclusion, I started focusing on production. A lot of people were focused on actors, the canon, audience development, board development, but no one was looking at production. So I started poking production managers across the United States going, we have to do better, we have to do better, we have to do better, which eventually ended up in Sharifa Joka saying, you will go to TCG and you will start speaking to this to TCG so that uh, other folks can hear what you're talking about. Um, and to say that you, you never know who's looking at you in the room, uh, two years ago, I was at this conference speaking about this issue uh, in Cleveland, and soon after I got, I, anytime I speak about this nationally, usually I get theaters going, hey, we saw you speak. We need a technical director. And I'm like, I'm not a headhunter. You all need to do this work. <laughs> uh, so uh, all of a sudden, an email soon after uh, the TCG conference in, in Cleveland, 
I got an email from the Guthrie, and I'm like, well, here's the Guthrie looking for yet another uh, another handout. And mm -hmm. I eventually opened it up, and it was like, hey, we would like you to apply for the director of production. I'm like, uh, you sure you have the right David Stewart? Because <laughs> I'm an academic, not a board production manager. And they're like, yeah, we, we have the right person. And I was like, how did you hear about me? It's like, well, the executive assistant to Joe Hodge, which was the new artistic director at the time, saw you speaking on a panel and thought you would be a good candidate. So I ended up putting my name into the till, and now I'm at the Guthrie and still doing a lot of work with USITT. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I am Jamika Holloway Burrell, and I am the current fair assistant director at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival for the Merry Wives of Windsor. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. <laughs> and um, my my trajectory has been a bit more idiosyncratic than you know what I am hearing here. I am a HBC, a proud HBC grad of North Carolina Central University oh, yes. in Durham, North Carolina. And I started out as a, a theater major. I was a theater major for two years before my family found out. <laughs> <laughs> my mama was not going to pay for no theater degree. <laughs> Um, and so I went into theater, and when she finally came around to it, she said, if you're going to be in theater, you have to find something that's, uh, something that's going to be lucrative. So I went into stage management, and I stage managed for a while. I also worked in New York City at the Lark Play Development Center um, as an artistic, um, uh, artistic intern and dove into a little bit of new play development. And uh, then I was down at Cape May Stage for a little bit as a company management intern, resident for a little while. And then I came back to North Carolina and, um, and with no plans to stay at all. And I started to go see more theater there from my hometown and surrounding areas and just realized there was a severe lack of representation on the stages. And I was like, okay, so I might just gotta change this. And um, I was a stage manager with, um, I'd say some very promising prospects in front of me but I decided to stay and start a black theater company in my town. So we are known as Black Ops, which is short for black, um, black opportunities. But yeah, and so that has been my career, my, my life. And so I run Black Ops and I direct because with a new theater company, you can't like afford to fly direct to them. So you <laughs> do the thing yourself. So that's where I am. And in order to enhance what I'm able to offer my community, I started to apply for um, for different opportunities, and I came across across OSF's professional development program, and uh, just really, I, I love the work that they've been doing, and really, really approaching things from a very equity lens. So um, I have made OSF my home for the last few months, mm -hmm. and I'm so excited to be here amongst all, all of you, kind people, <laughs> smart people. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Jennifer DeBella. I'm the Director of Education at Roundabout Theatre Company. Uh, I've been at Roundabout since 2005, uh, so a while now. Uh, and prior to uh, Roundabout, I was a, uh, a trained as a director originally, so director, teaching artist, working within the New York City Public Schools um, in Philadelphia for a bit before heading over to Roundabout and then I've been there. Um, and since I've been at Roundabout, I have done worn multiple hats um, and started some um, after school programs and enhanced the work that we've been doing in the public schools and um, and then I'll also created a workforce program in technical theater which I'll talk about later today. That's great. Um, so let's, David, let's play our video. I'll give you guys a little a little idea of sort of why we're, we're coming to this work. The arts. The arts. The arts are vital. The arts are exciting. I chose to work in the arts because there's a need inside of me to be creative because I think it's important to tell people's stories. Because I love to be surrounded by artists. I had four years in college thinking I'd love to make a career out of the arts, but not really knowing where to begin. How do I get started? How do I get in? Is the field growing? There are more options for career paths in the arts than most young people probably realize. I paint scenery for the theater. And I bring technology to the arts. The Bureau of Labor suggests employment opportunities in the arts are projected to grow by 11% by 2018. We don't want young people to abandon their passions because they're unaware of the career options that exist. I am a fundraiser for the arts. I'm a graphic designer. I work with teaching artists to provide arts education where funding has been cut. I'm a guy who builds scenery for the theater. The arts as a field thrives on new talent. 
I choose to work in the arts because I want to do something I'm passionate about because it feeds my soul. It took patience, it took endurance, it took talking to people that are doing things that I want to do, but it's happened, and it's happening. I now have a career in the arts. I didn't want to be part of a big corporation. I didn't want a job that I was excited to leave every day. I wanted a job that I would be excited to get up for every morning. I get to work every day with a community of artists. I have to be creative every day. Budgeting. Design. Cultivating relationships. Writing press releases. How to make our social media more meaningful than just liking a the photo. There's public relations. HR. I can say that it's limitless. The arts. The arts. The arts make you feel connected. The arts are a necessity. The arts are everywhere. Innovative. Imaginative. The yes. arts. decided um, to, to start a diversity initiative to begin the conversation around what Lord's responsibility is in training professionals and diversifying our pool of leadership across the country. We represent about 72 theaters um, that are spread out all over the country and, and when you look at the demographics of the people who are leading these organizations, they are predominantly white, um, predominantly male, um, and it's one of the things that sort of started this whole initiative. So over the years, we've built uh, different programs to address equity, diversity, and inclusion. And right now, we're focusing on uh, race um, as one of those important factors to, to figure in, because race and gender, uh, to help people of color and uh, women um, apply for more executive level positions. So out of that initiative um, has come the panels like these the Lord Ambassador Panel, which we do in conjunction with every Lord meeting we do now um, in different cities across the country. Uh, we have panels in which are targeted at students, um, as well as young and early career professionals to inform them about the career options in uh, Lord Theaters, as well as talk about you know um, our lack of diversity and why we need to challenge that, why we need to fix that, and why we need um, more advocates to help uh, supply the pool of candidates um, that are coming and working in our theaters. We also have a mentorship program that we're about to start and launch, uh, as well as a focus on recruitment, which is where I worked prior to taking over as chair this year, um, which was really targeted at really starting um, that first step in the a development pipeline for professionals, and that includes uh, the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival, uh, we now do a training program with them uh, once a year in which we take uh, students from around the country and actually put them through a training process in Washington, D.C. They're exposed to different um, career professionals. They learn about resume writing, um, cover letter writing. They learn about fundraising um, at the Kennedy Center, um, which is a big operation. So we're, we're, we're trying to build opportunities that actually show people uh, more than just continue the conversation. We're trying to be more active and proactive in providing um, resources. And you know, this isn't funded, we're all volunteers. Um, we're managers who are working around the country and focused on this work. And we're trying to build the network and grow the network so that we're pooling resources so that we really can attract the best and brightest candidates and the most diverse group. Um, because the theater should look like the world. It should be as representative as it is. And just because you don't see yourself in the work or leading these institutions, doesn't mean you shouldn't be there, and that doesn't mean you don't have a right to be there. Um, so that's been predominantly our aim right now. And you know, we're starting conversations, we're having conversations, but we are very interested in finding the talented young people who want to do these jobs in the future. Great. So thinking about the, obviously you, we've heard that everybody has different paths, and there isn't necessarily one cohesive uh, career path that any of us have taken, let alone that all of us have taken. Um, but sort of putting a pin in that, thinking about uh, tr career trajectories, um, I want, we've got some folks here that have done some real initiatives about sort of starting with early career professionals. Um, so 
Uh, Jen, do you want to start us off in talking a little bit about what you're doing at Roundabout sure. to support that? Sure. Uh, so for folks who don't know, Roundabout is a organization that's been around for 50 years, one of the largest nonprofit theaters in the U.S. Um, we produce on and off Broadway in five venues throughout Midtown. And the education department as it stands was developed 20 years ago um, and we serve 35,000 people annually, primarily working within New York City public schools for students and teachers, both using theater to teach other subject areas, but also helping uh, students and teachers produce theater in their communities. Um, so working a lot on technical theater education over the past 20 years. Uh, and then uh, also we've created some on-site after school programs uh, where students actually create theater in our professional spaces. So they have access to all of the equipment and the resources that our professionals have access to. And what we sort of found from doing all this work is that we were turning on these young people to, these, uh, to, to theater and to careers, but that we didn't see a direct pathway for some of our students to enter the field. And so we started thinking about, well, how can we even support these young people? You know, we wanted to first get them to graduate high school. So 100% of our kids that have worked in our school programs for the past 10 years have graduated high school. Really excited about that. <laughs> but what happens after that, right? So how do we keep supporting them? Um, and so about six years ago, we turned to our partners at IOTC, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, and said, you know, would you be willing to help us create an exposure program? You just get the word out about all these different career pathways. Because if you're a high school student and you're um, working in costumes, right, you, you design the costume, you might build or buy the costume, and then you also, uh, you're the dresser and you maintain the, right, you do everything, right? But and so in, in high school, you think that that's, that's all one job. But in reality, there's all these different <laughs> pathways, right? And so wanting to just at the very beginning just expose students to all these different positions and pathways so they can kind of find where they would fit. Um, so we created something called Hidden Career Path Days, which has been really successful, where students from all of our partner schools around the city come in, they meet IOTC professionals, and they get a chance to really just learn about these pathways. So again, really getting them excited about it, but no direct pathway. Um, and what we were finding is a lot of our um, young people um, weren't necessarily doing well in college. Like for instance, the uh, uh, Bronx Community College, which is, uh, which is where a lot of our students go to, the graduation rate is 10%, so it's really low. Um, so, you know, talking to our colleagues in IA and saying, you know, do you need a college degree? Can you learn on the job? Can you learn in sort of an apprenticeship model? And they said, no, I think, you know, I think we can train young people to enter this field in an alternative pathway type of way. Wow. So we created our theatrical workforce development program, um, and it's really geared towards 18 to 24 year olds who um, are looking for an alternative pathway into technical theater. Uh, it's a three year intensive uh, year of training at Roundabout with Roundabout technicians and teaching artists, um, a, a year, an internship, and then a, a job placement. So in the second year of their program, they actually are placed in full-time positions at partner theaters and organizations around the city. The whole training year, they're paid too, so we're trying to remove any barriers from entry, so folks that need to be paid um, that can often also can learn while they're being paid. And they're also paired with a one-to-one -one mentor from IOTC, so they can start building their professional network outside of the um, I, I, I a text they're meeting at Roundabout. Um, we also, they also have been, uh, been really uh, incredible opportunities for our fellows. They are um, able to observe backstage on Broadway and off-Broadway and go on incredible all-access tours. They all went to the USITT conference, which was amazing for them, so they got a chance to build, start building a national network and be part of the larger national conversation, really trying to give them as many opportunities as possible to build their, uh, their network. Um, we also have a partnership with an organization, a nonprofit called The Door, which is a drop-in center that really has like everything they could possibly need, a health center, uh, if you need, if you could become food unstable, you can get a meal there, there's housing, support, legal aid, whatever they might need, uh, and, and The Door has worked really closely with us to sort of help support the young people and also will continue to support them as they sort of go off into their own careers. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting and I think that people don't know is that you know, this is in New York City, um, the theater community has contributed like $12 billion to, to the city. It just, that's just Midtown alone, that's not even all the amazing theater that's happening across the city. Um, and there are 87,000 jobs directly related to the theater industry in New York City. Um, and what we are hearing from our colleagues both in New York City and around the country is that there's a real need for enthusiastic trained technicians. Um, and th in fact, the field is projected to grow up to 24% 
in the next few years. So we're, we think that there's a need and we feel like there's a pipeline issue in a way, a bit. So how can we sort of put those things together? Um, and then again, typical wages for these types of positions are $22 to $55 an hour. So these are good jobs too. They're you know, well-paying jobs and you can live a great middle-class life. Um, and so we're hoping that this, in, this program will impact not just uh, the young people, of course, that, that we're serving, but of course also the larger community and really sort of shift the landscape mm -hmm. too. Um, and we have, do you want to share a little video or do you think it's, like yeah, I think we should. All right, so uh, we, we just put together a little video because you know, I can talk about what I think is impactful, but I think it would be help, more helpful to hear from the fellows themselves. Um, so just a quick video to share and ignore the lady talking in the beginning with the sound issue because that's just me. You don't need to hear it. <laughs> 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 the sound issue, I think, um, at the beginning, so let's see. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just me talking, talking, talking. You already heard me. <laughs> we had some technical issues. Alliance of theatrical stage employees, and that was a way to share with high school students possible career paths for them backstage. And from that grew the idea, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could offer our students the next step? From that, the Theatrical Workforce Development Program was born. You're going to be able to find the place in the entertainment industry where your own skills and talents fit. You can work backstage in show business, have a great career doing things that you didn't even really imagine. I was lost. I didn't know what I wanted to do. College wasn't working out after my first year. So I kind of wanted to just get through the door and be in technical theater, but I didn't have the skill set. TWDP is helping me advance to the next step where I wanted to. She was very passionate about theater since she was little. But she couldn't find what to do with it. Once she started with the program, it was amazing. It's a new life for her. Just coming home with all these tools and just making things. You get to meet the people working in the field. That let me know exactly what I want to do. That assured me that I definitely want to do, want to be a carpenter. I want to be an electrical te technician because I'm seeing what it is and I'm like, I can do that. I am proud of her. <laughs> challenge for this particular program, well, I would say the thing that we, not we anticipated it, but it was really hard. So when we started, um, we, we had one, one fellow in particular who really was struggling, who wasn't able to, to show up for the trainings, was missing a lot, and we worked really hard with him to try to create a plan to keep him in the program, and, um, and we spent a lot of time trying to really support him, and our colleagues at the door, who's our or social service partner, kept saying, you know, you guys are coming from a youth development model where you really you continue to support the young people for forever, right? There's no, we don't sort of close the door on anybody. But in a workforce program, you have to you have to really sort of like get them ready for what they're gonna what they're gonna experience in the real world, if you will. And by continuing to give like a second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth chance, you're actually not preparing him to be successful in in work. And so we had to cut him from the program and that was really a really difficult decision for us. Uh, but it was important also for the rest of the fellows to sort of see that we were serious about this and that you know, you, in order to be successful in any career, you have to show up. You can't be late, you can't sleep on the job. So those were some, so those are the personal challenges of the program um, that we anticipated would be hard and difficult for us, but was we're, for educators and youth practitioners was, was really hard for us, really hard. Thank you. Um, so, Jamika, would you speak a little bit about the CARE program and give us a, a quick overview of what it is, but also I'm curious to hear from you as a participant what that experience has been like for you. Sure, sure. So, FAIR is OSF's uh, professional development program, and FAIR stands for fellowships, assistantships, internships, and residencies. 
and offers a wide variegation of different opportunities in design, management, artistic, and production where we pair participants up with, I'm saying we, um, and I'm a participant, but where they pair <laughs> participants up with, uh, dare I say, some of the greatest minds and practitioners in the country. Um, FAIR is also about restorative justice, and although it's not exclusionary at all, we do operate with the open application process. We do try to prioritize leaders of color, getting leaders of color into the pipeline, uh, because yes, there is definitely a pipeline. Um, let's see, uh, more about FAIR, let's see. Oh, also, um, age diversity is also that something that we like to talk about in, in FAIR. It's not just for young professionals, and we don't put an age limit on what an emerging artist um, should look like, career path should, should be. So it's definitely also for seasoned professionals who need to be kind of reinvigorated or want to be reminded of how robust and rigorous um, sometimes working in rep can can be. So <laughs> the other like very unique thing about FAIR is that you'll find we're not just looking for people who want to just go into the field and work. We're looking for leaders, influencers, people who are going to go into the field and transform it. So that's one of the things that makes FAIR really unique. Um, Right now, I am uh, an assistant director on the Mary Wilds of Windsor, and they really give you access to the room in a way that I, I haven't seen before. Every Wednesday, we're in, uh, people in, in artistic, we're in a meeting with Bill Roush. We sit with the artistic director, and um, there's room for us to share ideas and voice opinions, which is always very helpful in, in professional development programs, like strengthening that skill of knowing how to take up space in a room. So that's something that's also very um, distinguishable about OSF's program. Let's see, what else can I say? What, what else can I say? Okay. Um, just in terms of like your experience, um, how has it been beneficial? What's been surprising about it? What is different? Because founding your own company is a whole, a whole other totally. thing. And so in maybe comparing those two experiences. Sure, and I'll, I'll also say that um, <coughs> for me, I was, I'm trying to find these loopholes around grad school. <laughs> um, you know, I'm just a, a very visible creator. I don't claim to be a, a big academic or anything. Like, I create where my people have always created from, uh, which is like a very personal and visceral uh, place. So, um, so, you know, just a grad school all alternative just that the rigor of the, the, the schedules and just the, the positions that you'll be put in to meet different people and, and actually be a collaborator in the room. It's actually that's something that has been very beneficial to me. Um, my theater company kind of operates a lot like a troupe. So knowing and understanding the dynamics of collaboration um, is something that I've, I've, I think I've really honed in on at OSF. And also, again, knowing how to step into the room as someone whose voice deserves to be heard. It's just a skill that I feel like I've been cultivating a lot at OSF. Uh, learning how, I just think, you know, things that sometimes we, we take for granted. Just knowing how to, to communicate with other creative minds. Um, something that has been enhanced, I feel like, for me at OSF as a part of the FAIR program. So yeah, just learning more, com better communication practices. And then also being able to apply actively on a daily basis um, equity, diversity, and, and inclusion. And you know, and all, all my processes. And, and I was also, I wanted to apologize. Jamika Holloway Burrell, she, her, hers. Mm -hmm. She, her, hers. I don't want to put, uh, forget my pro pronouns. It's definitely something that we, we want to create a safe space for everybody at OSF. And it costs us nothing mm -hmm. to create a safe space and just say who we are for those people who may not subscribe to the non-binary. Non so, so that also at OSF, just kind of like being able to approach diversity, not just from a very a culturally specific lens, but very intersection, intersectional. Uh, yeah, that has been my experience. So. Great, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, and so thinking about, so programs that are, uh, the workforce development and FAIR program really working, like separate, I don't wanna say separate, because they're integrated too, but deliberate programs is, is one strategy. Um, and, uh, David, 
David, I was wondering if you could speak a bit to a, the recruitment and hiring practices that, that you've implemented the Gut3 that are infused with, for, sorry, that are less separate programs and more about who the institution is as a whole. Sure. Uh, so Joe Hodge came on board as artistic director <laughs> at the Gut3 two years ago. And one of the first things he did was go out into the community and find out what the community expected and wanted from the Guthrie. And from that, he developed a set of four core values for the institution, those being artistic excellence, porous walls and outreach into the community, a plurality of voices and equity, diversity and inclusion, and a fiduciary responsibility to the organization uh, so that we are on sound fiscal footing in order to execute the other values. And through that, it's, like, it's, it's great to put those things out there, but without uh, uh, substantial policies put into place, they mean nothing. Um, and one of the things is that we talk about these amazing programs, and they are truly amazing programs, is uh, that you also have to have an organizational cultural shift in these predominantly white institutions. Before you start talking about diversity, you yeah, have to talk yeah. about inclusion. Because if you come in and you are the only, which I so often am, have been, oftentimes we last maybe, and Leslie and I were talking, where are you, girl? We were talking about this yesterday um, in an affinity space called People of Color in Predominantly White Institutions, where we, uh, our lifespan in these institutions are three years. And it's not because we can't do the job, it's because we don't feel welcome in these spaces. So there needs to be an organizational, cultural shift in order for these programs to work. You can't simply go, uh, I have 10 things to do and diversity is number 10. Mm -hmm. Diversity, yeah. equity, and inclusion is how you do the other nine things. Mm -hmm. So every decision that I make at the, at the Guthrie is through the lens of those four core values. I don't separate them out. Everything I do in production is around those values. So with that being said, uh, one of the things that we did was uh, no homogenous creative teams so creative teams being directors and designers. Uh, for the longest time, we had predominantly male, uh, white male creative teams. Uh, that is no longer acceptable at the Guthrie. We now have to have racially and gender uh, diverse creative teams because it is important to have a, plural, a multiplicity of perspectives on the work that we do. So it's not only about what's on stage, but who gets to tell the stories that occur on those stages. Uh, the other things that we do is that all positions will remain open until we see a qualified and diverse pool of candidates. Mm -hmm. Now, this one sounds easy, but not so easy. <laughs> uh, and the, the, the reason that it uh, becomes important is that you sit there and go, okay, that's great. So we're looking for uh, a graphics artist in marketing. And 300 people apply. They get great, great. We have the LGBTQ, we have the disabled, we have people of color, and our final four are four white guys. Mm -hmm. That is not okay. The final four has to be a diverse and qualified pool of candidates because so often what I hear is, well, why aren't you just looking for the best person? Like they are mutually exclusive <laughs> notions, yeah. right? Like we people of color or other underrepresented communities mm -hmm. are not the best mm -hmm. in the field. Uh, and I want to dispel that notion right here and right now. Um, so some of the things that we need to do in that is actually in, in uh, attacking how we put out our materials in terms of looking uh, for posting for positions. And one of the first things our HR director said when I first arrived is, what do you, now you get a chance to make these job descriptions into your own image, what do you want to do? I was like, the first thing I want to do is talk about why I didn't apply for this job in the first place. Because when I looked at the job description for director of production, it says, you have to have a master's degree, or preferred, which we all know what preferred means, all right? You need to have five to 10 years of working in a multi-million dollar organization, a multi-venue organization. I'm like, that's not me. I'm an academic state uh, production manager. Uh, I don't have those skill sets. But nowhere in it does it say that you need to have cultural capacity. Nowhere in it does it say that you had to have leadership skills. Nowhere in it does it say that you had to be able to lead people and inspire people. <laughs> things that may actually draw me to this. Mm -hmm. So we started going in and changing. And one of the first things that I did was take out all the educational requirements in the job description. So no longer does it say that you have to have a BFA or an MFA or any of that stuff. It says, I need you to have X amount of years of this kind of experience. Mm -hmm. 
because when I'm looking for a welder, I don't need my welder to be able to do a dissertation on <laughs> King Lear. I need them to be able to weld on King Lear. Um, so I, we need to make that, that differential, uh, differential there. So those are the things that we've been, we've been uh, doing at the Guthrie. Uh, it is not easy work because what it does is it involves when you're, you have your hiring managers is that they have to go out and do uh, active, proactive recruitment. So often what we do is we're like, we did it at TCG and Art Search and we put it on our website and they're just not out there, they're not coming, which is bullshit, <laughs> all right? Um, we are out there, uh, but you actually have to kind of do some, some digging. You have to kind of do some looking uh, for, for where we are. Um, and uh, one of the things that, um, uh, again, going back into that proactive recruitment, is that um, there was a Washington Post study that said that for the average white person, in 100 of their friends, only three of them are people of color. So that's 97% of their network is white. Mm -hmm. And so we production managers that are in charge of hiring and looking long term for possibilities, hit this knee jerk reaction. It's like, I need this person, so I need them now. So I will go into my Rolodex. My Rolodex is already 97% white. In this industry, it's like 99.99% .99 white. And then I'm gonna find these three people and I'm gonna bring them in. At no point do we actually have some forethought in this. So what we have to start doing is encouraging people to start cultivating these networks, start working with Barrett, start working with Roundabout, start working with USITT, start working with TCG. Mm -hmm. And that requires effort and intentionality. Great, so touching on the, the retention challenge yes. um, and this three year fall off um, and staff, the need for staff development as well in terms of retaining a really fantastic uh, staff that we have. Um, Leslie, can you talk a little bit about what, what you discovered at CTG and what you're trying to do to help with that? Yeah, so um, I think I'll be a, a reinforcement of, of a lot of what my colleagues have shared. Um, so, uh, context. Um, uh, so, uh, like I think probably many theaters, like 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 Lord, like um, TCG, um, Center Theater Group has a, a staff-led diversity task force, um, and these are folks from across the company who have self-identified as being interested in leading equity, diversity, and inclusion work at our company. Um, and we started convening amongst ourselves, um, certainly um, sanctioned and applauded by leadership, but we, you know, I think increasingly. Um, being um, empowered to recognize that that company actually belongs to all of us, um, and we don't have to wait for our board or our funders or anyone who sits in a, at the C-suite um, to talk, to help us help make our company better and stronger. And that we're empowered every day to make decisions in our sphere of influence on our desks and in our work teams. Um, so with that kind of um, impetus, we we formed a, this task force and met monthly, um, and uh, you know had a lot of just challenging conversations amongst ourselves and kind of tried to be as honest and, and forthright as possible about um, how we felt working there and sort of getting to the inclusion um, theme that Dee Stu brought up. Uh, ultimately, we decided that we wanted to have equity, diversity, and inclusion be a value for our company. Um, and so we thought a, a good way to go about doing that was to create a purpose statement that was staff um, developed and to do a survey and find out who, who we were, who, who is Center Theater Group. Um, the folks who work, you know, at our company and, and also the folks included in our, in our, in our, our union teams. <coughs> so we, as a staff, developed the questions, we deployed the survey, we collected the information. These are people who have gigantic full-time jobs. Um, and it was really revealing. It was one of, one of the most revealing things I think that I've um, experienced in, in my professional life, um, to learn who we are. Um, so to reiterate some of what's been said here on the panel, 90% of people who work at Center Theater Group are uh, have a BFA or MFA, why I do not know. <laughs> um, we have um, more women than men working at Center <coughs> Theater Group. Um, we had people at Center Theater Group who weren't sure whether they'd ever received a promotion. Mm. Mm. They may have, but they actually didn't know for sure if they had. Um, we had, we have a, a, an enormous number of young people working at our company. So I believe it was, you know, 43% of the folks who worked at Center Theater Group were under the age of 35. Um, and this was in 2015. Um, so, you know, a lot of, lot of young people, but I, I want to touch on, on the three years. So one of the most um, sort of, and getting to retention, um, one of the most uh, sort of dramatic discoveries for our task force was that um, um, 
a large percent of, percentage, of our, percentage of our staff left the company after three years. Mm -hmm. And this is across kind of all um, job types, but primarily in um, those, those entry-level positions. Um, and that's also where we see kind of the most diversity in all kind of areas of diversity mm -hmm. in our company, right? That one to three years. So people are coming in, they're stepping in. We are somehow getting <coughs> diverse, and again, in all those different ways, folks in the door. <coughs> but we're not keeping them. They're not staying at our company. Um, which has required us at, in this now second year of our task force to have a really tough conversation about our company culture. Um, and to think about, um, even beyond Edie and I, how are we being respectful to each other? Are we kind? Um, do we listen? Um, can we work out a conflict in a way that is successful, where um, no one feels belittled? Um, you know, uh, who, who's in the room? Do people really understand uh, what each other do? Um, and I actually have some of my senior colleagues here in the room, and I see them nodding their heads. <laughs> um, and it's not unique to our company. Um, you know, I, I think this happens in a lot of places. I, I, you know, I think arts organizations are, um, you know, kind of a band of brothers, uh, or maybe a, I don't know, a, 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 a band of tribes, right? We, we, we talk about silos a lot, right? The education department, the marketing team, the, the management team, right? Um, and and then there's the other kinds of tribes. There are the, the EDI tribes, you know, the people of color, the women, and there's the other kind of tribes. There's the, you know, we call the upstairs, you know, our, our the, the senior leadership versus everybody else, right? And it's so funny because our building's so janky, you don't want to say that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I guess all this just to say it was, you know, you gotta open your underwear drawer. You gotta open it and be honest and say, wow, th this is, even before we get to you know, should we have more, you know, people with disabilities on our, in our production team, or how do we get more women um, in leadership positions, or, you know, how do we have an affinity group for people of color? We need to be nice to each other. We need to be, and, and I think if you're gonna embark on an EDI conversation in your company, right, this is a very, these are challenging things to talk about. Um, there, they, there's hurt, um, there's wounds that get reopened, um, and it's personal. And if the culture doesn't support that, just the day-to-day -day way we do our work doesn't support that, those conversations aren't going anywhere. So this was our discovery. Um, I don't have a great monologue now to tell you about all the things we've done to fix it. <laughs> we're, we're in that work now. Um, we're talking about having affinity groups, which is a solution a lot of um, theaters and other kinds of organizations have come to. Um, I think that's a good idea. Um, but we're also debating, um, you, know, the, uh, you know, we've had some questions from folks about the legality um, meaning, if we're sitting in an affinity space, like let's say we have a women's group, and um, I reveal in fact that um, a man in the company has touched me inappropriately, as part of that conversation, well, that's an HR issue. So how does that bubble up to into the appropriate official channels, right? Things like that. Um, but I think we're going to get to affinity groups, and I think that'll be healthy for our organization. Um, the other thing I wanted to share was that um, in talking about retention. So, so thinking about corporate culture and thinking about how to create healthy, safe work environments for people and not being afraid for them to, to find other kinds of tribes than the kind of official channels of, that exist in our company, and breaking down some of those walls, but not building new ones, I think is where we are right now, trying to figure that out. But the other thing I wanted to share about retention is um, um, we, like, uh, like Roundabout have, well not like Roundabout, their program's amazing, but you know, we're kind of jealous down here. Hashtag jealous. <laughs> um, you know, we have a, a, a very traditional but outstanding internship program that's run by Camille Schenken, um, who's my colleague in our education department. She has, over the last five years, built a, a, a robust, um, gorgeous, exceptional program that expanded um, the work that we were doing, um, kind of primarily working with um, some of the more exclusive and elite four-year universities in Los Angeles to now having partnerships with dozens of schools, including um, um, you know, two-year colleges, community colleges, career tech schools. Um, so we have a really terrific internship program that's pretty traditional. You know, interns get paid, everybody gets paid unless they want to receive school credit. Um, they get placed in departments with supervisors. Um, but I wanted to tell you about two aspects of this which are now informing our overall retention program. Um, one is that um, we have, primarily our interns are supervised by mid-level managers. Um, so, you know, not department heads, but people sort of working for them. Um, really, we have an amazing, this is one of the strongest bands of um, people, I would say, in our company. This, this is really where the heart and soul of CTG is where the work gets done, at that mid-level. Um, and these folks uh, may or may not have full-time staff working for them. So it's wonderful for them to have an opportunity to go through a selection process of looking at resumes, interviewing people,
people choosing an, an intern and then, and then supervising them, right? So it's a professional development opportunity for them. Um, and what we have decided is that this is a chance for us to change the hiring manager's mentality, right? Because these people are going to come on, go on to lead our theater and other theaters. And if we can help them change their practice and habit about how they look at resumes, who they'll take a chance on, because someone took a chance on me. I, again, I'm not a theater person, right? But Michael Ritchie saw something in me and hired me to lead the education programs at Center Theater Group without an MFA. I didn't know what anything about the Yale School of Drama. I didn't know the name 300 playwrights. I didn't know what a dramaturg was. <laughs> but this notion that you've got to look outside what you're comfortable with. And I mean, not that we've given up on our senior level managers, but these mid-level managers are, are, are exciting to us to think about how we can help influence their leadership, their, their, their sense of how to build a team. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to share, sort of an outcome of our, our internship program. Another outcome of our internship program is that, so we have our interns who are they're placing their departments and, and primarily work with those teams and those supervisors, but every Friday during their placement, we have a professional development se session for them. And this is a beautiful curriculum that Camille has designed um, that includes things like um, understanding the ecosystem of theaters in Los Angeles, because for some reason everyone thinks we're the only theater in Los Angeles, and God knows we're not, <laughs> and we may not be the right place for you to work. Um, and we want young people to know that, so kind of helping them understand that there's lots of things. You need to know yourself and know your passion and know your kind of um, theatrical philosophy and then think, think about a place that would be right for you. Um, we do things like resume uh, building, we do mock, intern, uh, mock, mock interviews, so just something to augment what they're getting in their placement and likely augment what they're getting at, in, their, in their, their degree program. Well, I'll, the, I'll share that a lot of the um, young professionals that I mentioned who are CTGers, those folks who are under 33 who are working for us day in and day out um, in their first one, two, three years, um, have come to us and said, well, gosh, some of the stuff you're doing with the interns on Friday, I'd like to receive. <laughs> that, that thing where you're looking at them, um, um, looking about, about leadership styles, we do kind of a, a, a process with them to discover their own leadership style. Um, taking that Myers-Briggs test so that you don't learn, learn more about yourself. Yeah, the old good old Myers-Briggs. Um, a lot of our folks were like, why, are, why aren't we getting that as part of, you know, I'm still a young professional, still discovering who I am, still discovering my voice and what I want to do and thinking about what my next step is. And you're pouring all this into interns who are here for 10 weeks, and I've been here three years. So we are now in the process, I'm going to be working with our HR director to um, find a way to create an emerging professionals program at our company that is a professional development program for our employees that will um, hopefully help them feel um, invested in, seen, um, and, um, and particularly help us in retaining um, uh, folks who are um, maybe a little different at Center Theater Group um, so that we can um, you know, kind of stop that churn at that three year mark. So, um, so uh, you all have touched on the organizational culture aspect of this. Um, and Calvin, yes, we need to step out from here too. Um, Calvin, can you talk about how you at Two River have incorporated EDI into your current strategic plan to help with that organizational shift and not just have it be a side thought? Um, so we had our strategic plan done by a professional management company um, about four years ago. Um, and since a lot of our priorities have changed significantly. So in partnership with my managing director, we took a look at our current strategic plan and we said a lot of this is outdated, a lot of this isn't really saying what it means. And now that we are approaching having a cultural shift in our organization around equity, diversity, and inclusion, we have to incorporate that into every bit of our programming, every department and how we face outwardly to the community. So, you know, how do we do that? How do we start that conversation? So every meeting, so we're actually doing our own strategic plan together as a team, and it's been a long time, and it's been a lot of work, and it's a lot of redrafting, but it's actually our senior management team sitting across from each other and questioning and critiquing and challenging people on what we are saying is our core value. And if we are going to talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion, where does it go in your set of values for your organization? How do you talk about it? Um, because you know, I, I'm very much a believer that diversity is not a verb. It is an aspiration, right? And I think too many people throw that word around like they're doing the work. It's, it, it's not true. Um, you have to be intentional at every level when you talk about um, uh, serving underrepresented communities. Well, what does that mean to your organization? 
you know, we want to um, provide, you know, programming for, for Latino playwrights or Latino audiences. Well, what do you mean by that? You know, why do, they, why do they deserve a place here? So we're going through every line by line and talking about what our goals as an organization are, but especially departmentally, uh, because it's a question now. When we have season planning now and we look at our design teams, someone raises their hand now and says, there's not enough women here. Uh, being able to say that so freely and openly in a room is, is a dramatic step forward mm -hmm. for some people. And, and the fact that I'm not the one who has to voice it all the time yes. is very good. Our organization has, has come to, to respect and understand that EDI is what we have to do. It's not something to sit around and gripe about how hard it is anymore. We have to take it back to the basics, which is what is written on paper about Two River Theater Company. Um, it's very important because once you see it at the staff level, that also has to sort of permeate up to the board. You know, a lot of these managers who are right now doing this work across the country will go to other organizations. They will retire. They will move on. But the board remains. So when we talk about fostering that culture and that sense of importance within the organization, we have to put those stewards to the test to see why it's essential that every manager that we hire, every artistic director and managing director in the future holds EDI as a core value. <coughs> Um, as part of their leadership style and as part of their practice because our organization needs it, our community deserves it, and our audiences need it more than anything, um, especially our young staff professionals. So we've taken on looking at our strategic plan in the most intentional of ways and really spelling out so that like diversity isn't just the buzzword and we all go, we get it. We want to be able to hand it to <laughs> anyone, <laughs> you know what I mean, and, and actually spell out so that they know what Two River Theater is doing to further equity, diversity, and inclusion. So that's been a process, um, especially in job postings and, and ad placements. You know, talking about production, I, I raised the question the other day. Um, you know, we have a sort of blanket statement for you know, Two River Theaters committed to the growth and vitality of you know, diverse working environment. And it said, especially underrepresented uh, populations. And I said, well, for production, is that true? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we set up to accommodate someone who's, for instance, has mobility issues to all of our entrances in our shops and back and forth across the parking lot. Do you mean that when you say that you're open? Because if someone applies and they have a disability, I want to know exactly how you're going to uh, address that with that candidate with a straight face and say that, yes, we are here for you. We are open for you. And I think that goes across the board, whether you're targeting women, people of color, um, and, and different genders and, and from different, different socioeconomic backgrounds and you're having a real conversation about how your organization is going to open up to those people. That's why I just say it doesn't stop with the word diversity. There's so much more behind what you're talking about, and that's creating equality for everyone who wants to work in a nonprofit theater and really you know, put in the sweat equity. You know, Why not uh, be open? So it, it's, it's a part of everything we do at Two River now, and we're in the EDI uh, Institute through TCG because the learning has to be across the board. It can't be one person mm -hmm. always rallying the group and, and saying, well, what, that's not right. You need a team going in there. There's nothing better than a partner in this work. Yeah. Great. So I do want to open it. Thank you all to, to all our panelists. I do want to open it up for questions and conversation. So just to give you a sense of what the next 27 minutes will be, <laughs> um, we'll have some time here to have some questions. So if you've got something brewing, think about what that might be. Um, and then we are going to save some time for um, some networking in, in the best way of that word, um, <laughs> opportunities for you to meet each other that are in this room. So if you hopefully got a name tag, I'll give you some more instructions in a minute. Um, but in the meantime, if anybody has either a question for um, our panelists or if your organization is doing something that you'd really like to share, I know that there's always so much um, wonderful expertise in the room that isn't always fully tapped in these types of panels. Um, we'd love to have you share something that you're doing or a challenge that you're grappling with too, honestly. So um, do we have any questions to share out? Yes. I really appreciate that. Thank you several times. Um, Childhood, and so a lot of foreign languages. Until we see someone do a play like Blue Door or Destiny. 
this something that, that new people as a pioneers of EDI and look for? Um, people that are sort of foreign to the trade? You mean specifically seeking out people that don't have a theatrical background? Sure, and maybe they're self starters in other ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, I speak at a couple of high schools in uh, Minneapolis and northern Minneapolis, and when I go, they the students are basically disengaged. They're like, I could give a shit what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> you're here because it's career day, and you're here, and I don't have to pay attention. Um, and so the teacher is fighting desperately to try to maintain the, the group, and they're they're on their cell phones. I'm like, well, time out. Don't put your cell phones away. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing on your cell phone? They're like. Uh, I'm doing homework. I'm like, you're not playing. You're playing a game. Show me the game you're playing. They show me the game they're playing. I'm like, let's talk about the game that you're playing. It's like, I play PlayStation 4. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, I play PlayStation 4. I'm playing Call of Duty. Oh, that one sucks. I'm like, it's all right. <laughs> I was like, have you guys ever heard of X Men Origins? It's like, yeah, I played that game. I was like, I was in that game. They're like, what? I was like, I did motion capture for that game. And they came up through the theater. I said, the, the, the opportunity to be in a video game came up through the arts. And I started talking about the opportunities through art that exists in doing the thing that they love most. Uh, that they could do, they could be a superhero and act it out. They could do voiceover work. They could write for it. They can do the design work for it. They can design the environments for it. They can game test it. And I was like, so much of that is cultivated through the work that we do. So yeah, mm -hmm. always looking for those non-traditional routes, looking for that thing that so many young people have, that artistic spark, that outlet. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't do enough to cultivate it. Mm -hmm. And we, we so busy sit there and go, put that away and pay attention. It's like, no, let's cultivate the thing that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And hope to, to draw them out into their artistic, in the general sense, way. And I think it to it goes both ways, right? So it's if you are interested in theater and you don't have that background, how do you frame what you've done in a way that connects? And also on the hiring side, how do we stay open-minded mm -hmm. to to seek those opportunities and to see that connection again? Talking about the uh, job descriptions, also. Um, of what are the actual skills that, that you need in order to succeed in this position. I also just wanted to add um, for um, we, I, something we haven't talked about, particularly for young people, middle school, high school, you know, even college, um, the notion of like the parent influence, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, well, actually, you, you joked about your mom, <laughs> but I, you know, I think it's a similar thing where you know um, parents don't know what jobs are available. A real, I mean, real job, like hardcore, like nine to five, that like job, job. Like I have benefits, job. Like I'm a be okay job. <laughs> but I mean, I'm being honest. I mean, I think you know when people think here, they actor and they go, oh, I don't. That's a t that's a tough life for my child, you know. And I, I think to to really think about the the fear that parents have and they want their kids to be successful and stable. One of the things we do when we do, we have big college fairs and career fairs where we're trying to connect school and work and exposing young people to all the different careers, which is I think oftentimes the pathway in for people who aren't you know, theater people. Um, we love to say, you know, so we just saw a show and how many people were in the cast? Oh, four or eight or whatever, great. Open your program to the back and look at all the staff. There's hundreds of people listed and these people have jobs in theater too. Right. Right, and so we, we talk to parents about that, whether we're doing our orientation for our student ambassadors where we require the parents to come, or we're doing that with our interns or at our college and career fairs, just reminding people that there's dozens and dozens of jobs. Um, and I think this video from, from Roundabout, or with Noel from, from, from Berkeley Rep, was really helpful. Um, we're also trying to do more with having these short videos that teachers can show in their classrooms that highlight um, jobs that we don't know about, jobs that aren't seen and talked about, um, and also showing faces of people doing them who look like our students. So there's just one little minute, minute videos, I think we're calling our working in theater video, video series. Just trying to publish those for people to get more information out so that folks can say, oh gosh, wow, I didn't know theaters hired graphic designers. I thought, you know, it was only directors, actors, playwrights. Right. So. Great, thank you. Um, yes, sorry. I just wanted to, to to raise a comment because so much of the focus is on entry level. And you're concerned about people who are being trained and lead your organization. And I think that not every organization is prepared to create a career path for every employee. Mm -hmm. You know, I was an intern at Center Theater Group. And you know, I came back and ran it. And, uh, <laughs> the, and I left because there was a certain moment where Los Angeles was no longer the place I wanted to be. And even for young people, 
there is a period of discovery that these organizations are, are wonderfully positioned to provide. And that discovery could become, I can do this somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And particularly in response to the comment about not theater people, ultimately, unless you're getting that spark of excitement from what you see on stage, and, and knowing that you're a part of that, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, generations today are gonna have three or four careers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this is a great place. It might be the place, it might be a first stop, it might be a stop you return. That's very fair, yeah. very, very fair, absolutely. Um, let's see here. Is that Diane? Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to commend all of you, all of you, on on the on the programming because I think this the diversification of our theaters is absolutely multi-layered. Um, I'm interested, and I want to address this to Calvin. What is Lort doing about the hiring of artistic directors, which is the other end of it, right? A very important end of it. Uh, we know we just had two theaters that had openings. Pasadena Playhouse and Arizona Theater Company. Uh, I don't know what that pool was. I don't know who the finalists were, but certainly we did not get a woman uh, at either theater or anyone of color. So what is the training that you're doing for potential leaders to go into these fields? Do we have to be patient? Do we have to be filled with rage? <laughs> what, <laughs> where should we be? In your opinion, about what our future is? Really great question. So there are about, I think, five to six openings across the country right now. And that became a very big part of what our initiative is doing, is actually evaluating and studying those positions and how those searches are going. Part of our process with our hiring subcommittee that we have in our initiative is to send a letter to these search firms and to the board chairs and to the remaining partner at these Lord organizations, and a letter in which we reassert our values and goals as Lord, that we're committed to diversification, we are committed to seeing um, top-notch candidates being considered as part of these search firms, or you know, if they're board-led by selection committee. So we're asserting that we do hold these values as a, as a member of the association, that we would like for you to uphold them as well. Now, can we hold everyone's hand, and can we walk them through, and can we force them to consider, no, we can't. We represent 72 different theaters. This initiative, again, is a body of volunteers, but it's something that we say that together, certain people have identified as a core value in their mission, and talking about where do these professionals come from? Are they being considered? When these searches go up for artistic directors and managing directors, uh, Wellesley uh, is, is represented here in the room, just published a study mm -hmm. where there's zero men of color men managing directors in the Lord Theaters. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about that? Right, we look and we turn to people who are at organizations in positions that are developing towards those goals and we put them forward. And I know that because I'm one of them, <laughs> you know? Um, but when you look at that sheet of managers of color who are male applying for these jobs, I'm probably number two or three and I've only been in the business maybe seven years. Mm -hmm. So we're we're, there, there is, we, we've talked about the pipeline and the pool and how we get there, but we have to identify and uplift those individuals who are targeting those positions at the same time. <laughs> so right now, a lot of what we've done as part of the Lord Initiative is to evaluate the data because we can't speak generally about who's putting there, but we're putting forward uh, a lot of our candidates who are people of color <clears throat> who have made themselves known to fellow managers, but we're also asserting to our theaters time and again that this work has to happen, especially when the searches come open and especially when the firms go, because we're gonna always be held to task. But we're 72 independent, different mission-led organizations. 72. We didn't all sign up for the, the same stuff, but we've identified this as an association. This is important to us. And how do we change this culture so we don't perpetuate it? That's the kind of best answer I can give you right now in terms of I, what so, we're doing. I'm so sorry. I just I want to I want to throw some props Lord's way. Um, I work at uh, Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival, and they've been working directly with uh, with us for uh, the last number of years in terms of introducing the young uh, these you know the, our students to leadership programs. 
um, across the country. So uh, their investment is very, it's, it's vertically integrated and I just, I just want to make sure that Lord have some props for that. That's uh, through Kirk Columbus at Trinity is kind of right. Like that. Um, and, and it's one of the places where we've had to focus because when we look around the room and we talk about development of talent <coughs> and identifying people who might be outside of theater or outside of these Lord theaters doing the work, that we also have to develop that talent pool at an early age too. So we've been more successful in really attracting people of color and uh, women uh, at the early stages of uh, at the college level right now um, in training them. Um, but then we also want to talk about how do we support those candidates going forward in their career so that they land at one of our theaters, so that we cultivate those relationships. So it's, it's all been a process and something that we're, we're trying to build towards. I also think um, something interesting is like how do we vet for practice and not just people who are, go, who are coming to like this, these institutions learning the vocabulary and then learning the vocabulary of Edie and I, and then like going out, like how do we vet for actual practice? You, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't know like what, how Lord does that or goes about that, but we, I mean, we get people in these positions because of what they say they do, and then, yeah, so how, like, what ways are this Lord trying to combat that? Just a question. And I'm also struck by who makes that decision, yeah. right? So, I mean, you know, you got to talk about board diversity because mm -hmm. they make that decision. And you got to talk about the consulting firms because they're the ones who are hiring yeah. and they're the ones bringing us, you know, the candidates. And if, you, if your leadership doesn't turn back and say, that pool's not good enough, yeah. consultant, yeah. keep working. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really that, where's, what's the, the lever is, is are the decision makers. And, and I hear you, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't have a solution. I'm just saying I hear you saying, how do we, how do we influence that? How do, how do our boards change? I think it's a related question, that, Diane, that, mm -hmm. that, to what you're asking. Mm -hmm. You know, because they're the one making that hire. And, and I think actually going back to what you were saying in terms of the intern program influencing how you think about professionals at your company, <coughs> I think there is, again, this is not the fix, but something to be said that if you have a organizational commitment like uh, David was describing at the Guthrie of we will wait until we have a diverse and qualified pool. If you have that as your standard at your organization, <coughs> how could, I mean, I know this happens, but how could the, uh, the board or the consultants not adhere to that, right? So you've stated and demonstrated and shown <coughs> that this is your commitment, and then you have something to refer to if you're not getting that at the executive level. All right, uh, great. So we're gonna do maybe two more questions. There is something, yes. <laughs> hey, um, so I guess Kate, she, her, hers. Um, I am a designer and I work primarily in Lord theaters and then also in New York. Um, and I'm super lucky that a lot of the regionals that I work at, you know, they'll bring me back for like one or two shows a season. So I end up seeing a lot of the same faces and a lot of the same teams. Um, and I think that's actually problem. And so, David, my question for you, because I think that your initiative is amazing. Um, what, do you have any examples of conflict and conflict revolu resolution when it comes to um, directors who want to work with their like core team? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's part of the conversation that Joe Hodge has with the, 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 the director. Before we say, yes, you're going to direct the show, we lay down our values to them and say, uh, wow. just so you know, you have to have a diverse uh, you cannot have a homogenous design team. And then there are times it's like, we also don't want that, those foursome, because we've heard that about that, that team, and they can be problematic or whatever. Uh, we don't want, we want to disrupt that team. Uh, so we've told that to, to, uh, to directors before. It's like, that, that foursome cannot be together. You're gonna have to shake it up and give us another listing of that. So the, the directors are told to give us a listing of, of possible designers. They give that list to me. I send it back uh, so that my staff has input into it as well. So we don't sit there and go, now you have this designer. And they're like, that designer was a hot mess for us. <laughs> so I don't want to put that stress on my, on my teams. So they get input as well. And then I send that back up to Joel Hodge. And then we try to hope, hopefully we mitigate that. Uh, we've been pretty fortunate so far in that regard. What if they say no? 
Yeah. The director. Then, then they don't get hired. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then they are not. They, that's they, very, very specific. Yes. And that's something that we don't do, at, and we should be doing at our theaters. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is very good. No, yeah, if they are not on board with it, they are not on board. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just to highlight the importance of that coming from the artistic director. director will do that. That's correct. They will say artistic license. They will say artistic freedom. And yeah. how do you, how do you, you know, that's a big uh, argument. Yeah, and then they could go work somewhere else. <laughs> but not if they're the artistic director. Well, it, it, exactly right. But you know, Joe Hodge has been in these rooms in these conversations, and as he likes to do, he's like, I'm the first one to pull the pin and throw it down the hallway in these meetings, yeah. talking about stuff. Like when Ward first put together their diversity committee, he's like, you all have no people of color on there. How, what, are you do, what are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, and he's actually the one that wants Lord to have more teeth in it, but it's hard to make a volunteer collective do anything. Hmm. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I have another question for David, actually. Uh, I was really encouraged to hear from Jen that Roundabout's program not only has such great support from IOTSI, but that IOTSI is, in fact, a really willing participant and mm -hmm. partner in it. Mm -hmm. uh, at our theater, we're hiring for a head electrician mm -hmm. right now, and currently all of our department heads are white men. Mm -hmm. uh, I was really excited at this opportunity, and I was excited to be asked to sit on the interview panels, and I was really disappointed to find that all four of our final candidates are male. And in fact, throughout the interview process with three of them, they actually specifically referred multiple times to working with their male crews. There was never any discussion of mm -hmm. women. Correct. Mm -hmm. And there is only one candidate of color in the school. So when you're hiring a department head position, obviously there are a lot of voices giving their input as to what the priorities for that candidate ultimately are. Right. But how do you address those conversations with your union partners to ensure that they are prioritizing the same values that you are at the government? Right. Uh, the it is in our union agreement that the, that management reserves the right, obtains the right to hire who we determine uh, is qualified for our positions. Mm -hmm. So the union really has no jurisdiction within the walls of the Guthrie when it comes to who we determine are qualified. So in our hiring order, it's uh, when we go through that, it's very specific. It says um, hiring the, the, the Guthrie retains the right to hire the most qualified candidate as determined by management. Um, uh, I hate this, this phrase, affirmative action goals, um, as well as um, emerging young talent. And then it comes to those in previous in employment, followed by seniority, followed by those who work in the Twin Cities. So there's this litany in there. It all resides with us when we do it. So it's up to me to cultivate the hiring directors uh, hiring managers to actually start embodying that. And one of the things I put forward is that they have to have ask the same set of questions because I think one of the, the end arounds that people can do on that is this is they go, great, we brought these candidates in, but I'm going to ask, you know, the guy that I really want the softball questions and I'm going to ask the, the, the woman candidate the hardest questions that are impossible for them to answer. So they have to answer the same questions so that there is no workaround and, and I need to be part of that process as well. Great, so um, I know I see you and I see you, and sorry, but I do wanna, we've got six minutes, and I do want, it's not a lot of time, but I do wanna have an opportunity for everybody to, um, to meet someone. Um, and so for you all, if you have further questions for individual panelists, I encourage you to, to meet them and ask. Um, so just to put a pin in this conversation, obviously, there's a lot of work that's being done, which I think is really tangible and useful and is furthering these goals. Um, and there's a lot of work to still be done. Um, and just to call out TCG also for being a real partner in all this work and actually really leading a lot of these conversations. Um, and if you all are interested, particularly in um, uh, TCG's EDI uh, Institute, um, and there are other professional development opportunities. So just check out tcg.org for all of what they offer there. So um, this is going to be a little experiment. We'll see how it'll go. Um, hopefully you all uh, grabbed a, a name tag with some uh, color on it when you walk in. Um, so the idea here is that you'll meet uh, a person of every name tag color. And if you didn't grab one, that's fine. Just join in. Um, and so. Part of the idea is for uh, young, early career folks and students to have an opportunity to meet with those that are perhaps further along in their career trajectories. 
Um, and so what we'd like to do is, again, we don't have a lot of time, so it's going to be a sort of like speed dating thing. Um, and, but an opportunity to, to, to actually meet somebody. Also, I would like to encourage you, if you are a student and are not registered for the conference, to make sure you sign in with your email address so we can call up. Um, and so just a couple of suggested prompts are, what are you working on right now? Because all of us are doing something. Um, and why, why you're interested in working in theater or why, what keeps you working in theater. Um, so I want to thank our panelists before we start. Thank <laughs> you. 